So let's take a look at problem number one. Here we have the altitude uh, up uh, the side of a mountain and the temperature recorded, and we're doing it for two different mountains, so we really have two different columns of data, really. You could think of this as mountain number one, mountain number two. All right, now you can see that as the altitude goes up, 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 the temperature in general goes down, 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 down. So let's see how something like this would look like on a scatter plot. So we plot it as points, 0, 8, 0, 10. So I plotted here 0, 8, 0, 10. 2, 8, 2, 9, those are two separate points. 2, 8, 2, 9, I'll just show you one more. 4, 7, 4, 9. 4, 7, 4, 9, and all the rest of the data is plotted there as well. Again, each little pair of, of, number, of points here are two separate mountains. But you can still see there's a clear trend uh, here. You can see that the general trend is down, and so as the altitude goes up, the temperature goes down, so we say this is a negative correlation. We talked about that before. All right, but let's answer a few questions. First question, what were the temperatures at ground level for the two mountains? So we're just interpreting here. Ground level means altitude of zero, and we can see the temperatures were eight uh, degrees and 10 degrees. So we'll just write down eight degrees and 10 degrees. All right, problem number two. What can you say about the relationship between altitude and temperature? So altitude and temperature, we already gave it away. It's a negative correlation. So that just means that as the altitude goes up, the temperature goes down. So negative correlation. So I told you these problems would be pretty quick. We're just answering quick questions to try to get a feel for different situations, interpreting what the scatter plot is telling us. Let's take this down and work problem number two. All right, here we have some data in problem number two for the number of emails sent from some sort of store online and the number of orders received from various customers. So with one email, we actually, from one customer, got only one order, and another email only sent one email to another customer. We got two orders from that person. And as we go up and up and up in the emails, eventually it looks like we're getting more orders the more emails we're sending. So let's do a scatter plot here and see if we can interpret some results. So here we have 1, 1, 1, 2, and we can just plot these guys. Uh, 1, 1, and 1, 2. Right, let me catch up here, just make sure I'm doing everything right. And then we have 2, 3, 2, 4, 4, 4, 4, 6. So I'll just do those four points. So 2, 3, and 2, 4, and 4, 4, and 4, 6. All right. Next we have 6, 7, and 6, 8, and 8, 6, and 8, 7, and 10, 7. So we're just plotting these last five points. So 6, 7 is up here, and 6, 8 is right there, and 8, 6 is right here, and 8, 7 is right here, and 10, 7 is right here. So this is the scatter plot that we have, uh, and it's perfectly fine to work with this, but I've drawn a prettier version down here so that we can kind of more, uh, kind of more accurately look at it. Now, notice what's happening. We do have a positive correlation here, but then notice what is happening. As we get to this point, we have really, we don't really get any more orders. I mean, it looks like the orders are topped out around seven or eight. Um, but we do have a very strong positive correlation, but then it just kind of stops. Why do you think that is? That's because if I get two or three emails from someone, I might become interested, maybe aware of their business or whatever. But if I get like 100 emails from somebody, I'm going to start ignoring them. And I'm, it's not going to lead me to want to buy from you. I may actually avoid your business if you send me too many emails. So you reach a saturation level, basically, where at first you're, you're making more and more money, more orders, but then you hit saturation because beyond, beyond that, more emails doesn't really do anything. So what can you make of the data for X greater than or equal to 8, where X is the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, emails here, greater than or equal to 8? It's the saturation that we talked about here. So I'll just say saturation. In other words, another way to say it is exactly what we said before. There's a very positive cor correlation here, but then it starts all the way up to this at point, actually, up to six emails. But then after that, it stays constant, and there's really no correlation of the data beyond that point. So beyond uh, X is greater than six, there's no correlation because the, the orders stop going up. Part B, how many emails would you recommend the store to make each month? 
Well, if I send one email, I'm going to do this many orders. If I send two emails, I'm going to do this many. Four emails, I'm going to do this many. Six emails, I'm going to do this many. But as I go up higher, I don't really get many more, much more bang for the buck. So if it were me, I would actually recommend six emails a month. If you want to be nice, maybe four emails a month, but probably, probably somewhere around six emails a month is the best bang for the buck because beyond that, you're just going to make people mad. So six emails. Six emails per month. All right, let's take this one down and do our last problem. All right, here's our last problem. We have a running club where we keep track of the distance and time that the members are running. With a one kilometer distance run, we have uh, three different people making four minute, five minute, six minute uh, uh, times. Two kilometer run, we have this data. Three kilometer run, we have this data. So let's plot this in a scatter plot and see if we can answer a few questions. So we have one comma four, one comma five, one comma six. So we have one uh, kilometer distance, four, five, six, uh, and this is minutes. Then we have two comma 10, two comma 12, two comma 13. So two comma 10, two comma 12, two comma 13, that's the uh, group right there. And then we have three comma one, three comma 12, three comma 15, three comma 17. So we have three comma one, three comma 12, three comma 15, three comma 17. All right, so let's first of all take a look at in general what's happening here. Is it correlated or not? In general, the slope is up and to the right as the distance of the race gets longer, the time takes longer, so it's positive correlation. And then the question here says, what do you notice about the maximum and the minimum time for each distance as the races get longer? Now, I'm not going to waste my time writing a sentence. I'm just going to explain the answer because it's easy to understand, but a lot to write. What we're really looking at is, as the race gets longer, notice at the one distance mark, we have a very tight spread in time between four and six. But at the two kilometer mark, the spread becomes a little bit wider between 10 and 13. And at the three kilometer mark, we have a huge spread of data here. So as the distance of the race gets longer, we have a wider and wider spread of the data. And this makes sense because as the race gets longer, you're gonna have more of a distribution on the real athletes who can do well and then the people who aren't as good at running, maybe they're having a harder time with that longer distance. In other words, a wider distribution at higher distances makes sense because it's gonna much more strongly depend on how prepared you are for that distance of a race. So either you're gonna do really well or maybe not so well. Whereas for a very short race, lots of people can run one kilometer, no problem. All right, so that's problem uh, part A. I'm not gonna write that down, that's, that's what we see. We see a wider variation as the race time increases. Part B. There is an outlier in this data set. What is it and what could it mean? What is the outlier? Well, if you look at this, this is a nice correlation going up, 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 but then we have this one data point here at three comma one. This means someone wrote, or, uh, someone ran a three kilometer race in one minute. That is an outlier. This data point is very far away from the remaining three people in the club up here who took anywhere between 12 and 17 minutes. And you have one guy here, or one lady here, who apparently only took one minute to run this distance. Now, I think that's actually faster than the world record for a, a race of that distance. So uh, it's, it's very unlikely to be true. Probably what's going on is somebody wrote a one down for the time, but they really meant 13 or 15, and they just marked it wrong, they typed it in wrong, and it's called an outlier. So when we do statistical analysis, we always have to be careful about outliers because one little outlier can throw off the meaning of this graph completely if you're not prepared for it and ready to, to look at it and maybe say, okay, maybe that's not true, then maybe you're going to reach you know, a conclusion that's not, that's not right. So when we do statistics, we have ways in which we can kick out the outliers and only look at the core amount of the data, and that's what we would have to do in this case. So that's the outlier, probably not true, it's probably an error in the data. So in this lesson, we just answered a few questions about these scatter plots. that's all we're doing. I'd like you to wrap this up, make sure you understand, follow me on to the next lesson, and we'll do a few more problems of this type. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.